Amen. Thank you for that. Take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to finish out Ephesians here in the next uh, few weeks. Uh, uh, probably take, we may not finish uh, before Christmas, so we might take a little pause for a couple weeks around Christmas and look at, uh, at uh, passages of Scripture relating to the birth of our Savior, but we'll finish it up. Uh, should be right around that time or maybe right into the beginning of the year. Of course, we're entering uh, the final uh, half of chapter 6 is dealing with the armor of God, and, and we'll look at that in the weeks to come. Uh, tonight, Paul gives us two challenges when he tells us to be strong in the Lord, number one, and then he tells us to stand against the wiles of the devil, number two. In fact, four different times Paul tells us to stand or to withstand the attacks and deception of Satan in Ephesians 6, once in verse 11. We're going to read that here in just a moment. Twice in verse 13, and we won't get there uh, this week, but we'll start there the next time. And then once in verse 14, and so four different times, encouraging God's people, especially in this day, to stand and withstand uh, the attack of Satan. Look at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10 and 11. And in fact, uh, I'll read those and you can follow along. Finally, my brethren, uh, be strong in the Lord. And he uh, finally, uh, we had our senior, uh, uh, senior Thanksgiving lunch yesterday. Senior adults had a wonderful time, wonderful crowd. And and uh, our, our preacher, Brother Yulo, from across the bay in Spanish Fort, uh, got to the end and he said, and finally, uh, but it wasn't finally, he said uh, he had two more points after that. So that's just a preacher thing. Finally, uh, Paul says, and yet we got a lot more to go, but finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And that word wiles means deception, trickery. Uh, God is searching, especially in this day, for uh, churches, for people who will stand, who will be able to stand, uh, and who will stand in the gap in our day, who will stand against the evil of our day, and will stand for right, and will stand for God. Uh, I love Ezekiel. He, well, way back when I first got saved, these a couple of passages in Ezekiel became very uh, important to me. Ezekiel 22 and verse 30, he said, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. And that gap Ezekiel's talking about is a void, a place where uh, someone uh, should be standing, but they're missing. And God is speaking about standing in the gap in our day in a spiritual sense, uh, not just standing around uh, physically, but standing, uh, standing in our resolve and in our soul and in our spirit, making up the spiritual hedge, the difference in our day. So let's pray. And then we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 6 and, and see what Paul means when he said to, to be strong in the Lord and to stand against the wiles of the devil. Let's pray together. Father, help us tonight as we look at your word, uh, speak to our hearts, uh, help us to have receptive hearts and spirits and, and help us, Lord, to be uh, open and uh, receptive to your word, and may your word as its promise not return unto thee void, but may it accomplish that work in our heart that you intend it to. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And before we get into the bulk of the message, let me, let me just give you a few thoughts about standing that are true both physically, but also when it comes to standing uh, spiritually. And a couple of, of thoughts that are very true. It takes balance and equilibrium to stand. Uh, physically, it takes balance and equilibrium to stand. Uh, physically, I've heard of people having severe cases of vertigo and not being able uh, or to have the equilibrium to stand. I've seen folks with inner ear problems, which is where uh, physically we get that stability uh, to be able to stand. And because of that, not being able to stand. Uh, last week, I was able to go for a couple of days 
days and visit my dad who turns 80 this year. And boy, we're, we're, you know, my brother and I, we're ending a little different season with our parents and it's going to take a little bit adjusting our schedules. We just decided and determined because he won't travel. He'll never, you'll never see him here in Mobile again. He's just getting to that age for him. And I know many of you are that age and still travel, but he's just not going to travel. So we've decided we, we need to be good sons and and a couple times a year we're just going to have to take a couple of days. We get to take a couple of days. We want to make it sound like it's a bad thing. We want to do that and want to be uh, for him what he needs us to be. But we found out as we visited him that he's fallen a couple times recently, just kind of losing his balance and losing his equilibrium. And what is true physically is also true spiritually. We must have a balance spiritually. We must have our spiritual bearings and spiritual equilibrium to be able to take our stand. And another thought about standing, it takes purpose to stand. Uh, it takes, uh, when we don't have anything immediately pressing on our plate, uh, we probably usually sit. We like to relax. And uh, when we're relaxing, we sit. When we have somewhere to go, though, and something to accomplish, we stand up. And uh, stand up. Love the great hymns of the faith. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner. It must not suffer loss. Standing on the promises of Christ my King. The preacher said it's standing on the promises, not sitting on the premises, amen? And so we're to stand and get out and to serve the Lord with gladness in this spiritual life. Uh, we must take our stand and in the face of adversity and opposition, uh, we must stand up and walking by faith and walking in the spirit begins by standing up. And so it takes purpose to stand. Think about this, standing can be a sign of respect but it can also, at the same time, be an act of defiance. In fact, look back at our passage at verse 11 of Ephesians chapter 6, where he said, Put on the whole armor of God that ye may, may be able to stand against in defiance of, against the wiles of the devil. When we stand for God, we're standing against the devil at the same time. Uh, when we stand for our flag or we stand for our anthem or stand for the pledge, we're showing our respect when we do, but we're also showing our defiance to the tyranny and uh, to the persecution that we face in our country's history as well. Americans have always had that spirit uh, to stand for what's right, to stand against wrong, and it's that spirit that is as important Important as the physical act of standing. It's the will to fight, the will to take our stand. It's like the little boy, and those of you that teach, and whether it's in the Christian school or teach in a Sunday school setting, uh, you've all probably had a, a child like this. It was the little boy. He had a he just had a he, he had one of those streaks. He had a strong will. And his teacher finally had to tell him, just sit down and uh, and and he reluctantly sat down, but as he did, he muttered under his, under his breath, I'm still standing on the inside. And it's that spirit, that will uh, to stand that's made uh, America great and uh, standing. At, at the same time that we're standing for something, we're also standing against that which would seek to take away the freedom and the greatness of this country. And so when we take our stand for God, and his word, we also take our stand against Satan and his devices. By the way, I don't know about you, but I want to stand for the right things. I, I want to stand for the things that God is for, and I want to stand against those things that God is against, and for the most part, we can find those in the word of God. I, I want to have the wisdom and the discernment to know the difference, and God grant us the courage and the resolve to take our stand when we do. And so standing physically is all of those things. But really, here's the message for tonight, because it also takes strength to stand. 
And in verse 10, we're reminded to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Because without his strength, we can't possibly take our stand uh, against the error doctrinally, against the compromise of our day. Uh, without his strength, uh, without his strength, we'll cave in. Without his strength, we'll crumble under the weight of it all. Without his strength, we'll get bowled over and swept away. Without his strength, we'll faint, which is another word for giving up. I love Proverbs 24, 10. It's been an encouragement to me. It's been a source of inspiration and conviction to me. And it simply says this, if thou faint in the day of adversity, if you give up, if you fail to stand, if you faint in the day of adversity. By the way, you serve God long enough, you're going to face adversity. Hey, you stay married long enough until death do us part is God's plan. You're going to face adversity in your marriage. You're going to face it if you're trying to lead your home and you're trying to rear your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord in the day in which we live, you're going to face adversity as a Christian person parent, people are, gonna, uh, people are going to criticize you uh, for having loving discipline and, and some of the standards that we have and, and that we hold dear. And so you're going to face adversity, but God give us the strength to stand. If thou faint in the day of adversity, the, the proverb says, thy strength is small. And he's not talking about physical strength there. We're going to see that here in a moment. Uh, he's talking about our spiritual strength. When we are not strong spiritually, we can't stand when adversity comes into our lives. Now, I want to tell you something. We've got, uh, we've got to uh, teach our children that everything's not always going to go well for them. Everything's just not always going to be smooth sailing. Everything's just not always going to be a bed of roses. Hey, you you're going to have to be prepared for adversity to come. You're going to have to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might because adversity is going to come. So Paul tells us to be strong in the Lord. But just exactly what does that mean? How are we to be strong in the Lord? Uh, first of all, let me say this about that. We have a heavenly father who is very strong tonight. Uh, he is strong, and uh, he's a God of great strength, and he desires for his children to be strong. Several other times in Scripture, he inspired the Apostle Paul to encourage his children to be strong. Take your Bibles, look at 1 Corinthians 16 and verse number 13. He said there to the believers in Corinth, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. And Paul challenged them to stand fast, or the idea of having our feet fastened in place, anchored in place, firmly fixed in place, uh, stand fast in the faith. Uh, the word quit there, quit you like men, means to act like or behave like men would be expected to and be strong. Uh, Paul encouraged Timothy to be strong in 2 Timothy chapter 2. And verse 1, he said, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I love this because one of the very first things God told Joshua in his new role as leader of the nation of Israel for the, uh, was to be strong and of good courage. Look at Joshua 1 and verse 6, and I'll read that to you. The Bible says there, Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. And it's easy to see why Joshua would need to be strong. He was stepping into the shoes of Moses, probably one of the greatest leaders that had ever lived. Uh, he would be leading millions of 
Jewish people into a land that they had refused to go into 40 years before, a people that had become accustomed to complaining and to being contrary and to not wanting to follow God and the leadership that God put in their life. And so he was going to need the power and the strength of God. He knew there would be fears to overcome and battles to fight and land to possess. And he would need to be strong and the people would need to be strong and their strength would have to come from a strong God. And our faith is going to have to come from a strong Heavenly Father. That's why Paul is telling us to be strong in the Lord. In the Lord. He doesn't just say be strong in yourself or strong in your physical strength or strong mentally, even though I think there's a lot to be said about being mentally strong and emotionally healthy and physically strong. That's not the strength that God is telling us about here. He's talking about be strong in the Lord. Now, the strength we need must come from within, in the Lord, from within our relationship with the Lord. If we don't have a healthy relationship with the Lord, uh, with his word, uh, in prayer, in meditation, abiding in him, uh, we will not have the strength that we need. We won't have the access to the strength that we need that Paul is talking about here. He's reminding them that they cannot stand in their own strength. We don't work this strength up in the flesh. Uh, the, the Bible says the arm of flesh, or the song says, the arm of flesh will fail you. Ye dare not trust your own. And so we cannot win spiritual battles and spiritual victory in the strength of the flesh. We must be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. That word power there in this instance is a word that means complete domination, complete dominance. Uh, back in Ephesians 6 and verse 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We can choose to go into this spiritual battle with whatever puny, minuscule strength that we can muster up in our own flesh and in our own spirit and our own emotion, or we can choose to go into battle with his absolute dominance that we can be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, his power and his might. But, but how do we be strong in the Lord? How do, we, how do we access his strength? How do we make his strength our strength in the Lord? Uh, first of all, by not depending on self, and by not depending on our own strength. Now, I want you to listen to this. We're going to look at some scripture here in just a moment. But I want you to really think about this and, and listen to this. To the, to, to the degree that we're determined to fight this spiritual battle in our own strength, refusing to be strong in the Lord, almost like, hey, God, I got this. I, I, I can do this. To the degree that we are determined to fight this spiritual battle in our own strength, he will allow us to try. I mean, he's going to say, okay, go ahead. If you think you can do it without me, go ahead. Uh, if you think that you've got this, go ahead and try. And the more we try, the more we fail because we do not have his strength, and it's his strength that he's talking about. But when you and I acknowledge our own weakness and we yield to his strength, then he begins to work in us and through us. His strength spoke the worlds into existence while our strength is very fragile. Uh, that's why there's so many fragile Christians. That why there, that's why there's so many fragile uh, emotional states uh, among Christianity because uh, we're relying on our own strength and our own strength is very fragile. It's easily, it's easily uh, crushed and it's easily dismissed, but we must face it in his strength. Not only can we not depend on our own strength, but then in our weakness, 
when we realize and understand, you know what, I'm not strong, I'm weak. I'm not physically strong, I'm physically weak. I'm not, I, I don't have the strength I need. So in our weakness, we must look for his strength. Now, I want you to take your Bibles and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we'll come back to Ephesians 6 before we're done. But look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And I want us to look at Paul's journey, Paul's writing, uh, Ephesians 6. He knows what he's talking about when he talks about being strong in the Lord because God took him on his own journey uh, so that he could realize uh, what it meant to be weak in himself so that he in turn could be strong in the Lord. And I think it's a process that every one of us has to go through, something similar to what the Apostle Paul went through. It won't be the same. It'll be different, uh, but it's still a process that we go through to come to the end of our self-dependence. We come to the end of trying to be strong in our own, and we, and we yield ourselves to his strength. Look what he said in verse 9 of 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. By the way, his grace is enough. His grace is enough. It, it always, it, it, I, I fear when I hear Christian people say things like, I can't take anymore. Yes, we can. Because his grace, now you can't take anymore in your own strength, but, but his grace is sufficient. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. It always, uh, I, I, I fear for that uh, person because his grace is sufficient. Hey, looking unto Jesus, looking for his grace. My strength, he goes on to say, is my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, what does that mean? That simply means you won't realize my strength until you, until, you, until you come to the place where you acknowledge your weakness. As long as we're trying to do it on our own, we'll never recognize, we'll never uh, be able to appreciate, we'll never experience his strength because his strength is made perfect. It, it comes to fruition. It, it, it shows its power in us and through us in our weakness. Look what he said. Paul said, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Now, that's not the way we look at things. Man, we look at, I know there's, uh, Brother John Sinareski, man, pray for him. He, I think he's getting out of the hospital maybe tomorrow, but he's been in and out, and he's a Sunday school teacher here and never gone through anything like this. And, uh, and we, we, we go through physical uh, ailments like that. And, uh, and boy, we don't see it as being a blessing. We don't glory in our infirmities. We don't glory in our financial trouble. We don't glory in the obstacles that come into our life. We don't glory in the difficult times. And that goes back to, uh, back to the fact that, that the fact is there's going to be adversity in the life of every believer and you just have to change your perspective on it and you need to begin to glory in it. Why? He said, I will glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. Paul seems to be saying, man, I get happy. I get excited when these physical limitations, when these infirmities come. Why, Paul? He said, I take pleasure in reproaches. Who likes, to, who likes to be reproached? That means to be rebuffed. That means to be, uh, to be kind of attacked a little bit. In necessities, that means we need things. Who, who wants to glory uh, when I don't have what I need? I don't feel like I have my needs taken care of. Uh, glory in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For Christ's sake. Why? For when I am weak, then that's when I'm strong. Now, the word Paul uses for power in verse 9 is the Greek word dunamis, uh, which, from which we get our English word dynamite. And so that's the kind of power we have available to us in Christ. 
but it's the power that we'll never access. It's the power that we'll never experience. It's the power that we will not have until we, we realize how weak we really are. Uh, but Paul had to go through some things to learn how to come to this point in his life. Now, we started at verse number 9. Go back up to verse number 7 and 8 of 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Look at verse 7. He says, unless I should be exalted above measure. And what Paul's talking about there is God was using him. Uh, God called him up and gave him a private tutoring session on the, the apostles' doctrine, the, the doctrine for the New Testament church. And, and Paul spent the rest of his life uh, starting churches, teaching churches doctrine uh, that, that has carried on to our day. Uh, you know, we're Baptists by conviction because uh, we believe that's the same doctrine God taught Paul to teach to the church. And, and we look at that and we study that and we see that it's consistent uh, with what we believe or, or our beliefs are consistent with the Bible doctrine. And, and so uh, Paul said, in order for me not to become proud, in order for me not to think, wow, look at how good I am. Look at how powerful I am. Look at how important I am. Look at what I've accomplished. Uh, he said, God had to do some things in my life. He said, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation. That's all the things that God is, is giving me and telling me and using me. He said, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. A thorn in the flesh. God allowed him to have some physical ailments that were ongoing, that weren't going to get resolved, that he was not going to be healed from, that he was not going to see relief from. He gave him a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me. Now, when you think about buffeting, that's kind of that's jostling. That's kind of that, that's kind of a constant. A, a constant irritation. That's just kind of a constant source of adversity in our life. And, and, uh, and each of us can look at seasons or look at things in our life that's just kind of a constant. It, it's not going away. It hasn't gone away. Doesn't matter how much we pray. It's just something that we have to adjust to and learn to live with and realize that this might be something God is doing, certainly something that God is allowing. And he he said he sent that to me lest I should be exalted above measure. Now here's the message. Paul had to learn to live with limitations in his flesh so that he in turn could learn to depend on God's strength. And I think sometimes we're just not patient. We just, we're not willing uh, to live with some things. We're not willing to adjust to some things. We're not willing to adapt to some things, uh, realizing that this might be God uh, working in me, realizing, helping me realize my limitations so that the power of God can work through us. Uh, by the way, Paul fought it at first. Three times he asked the Lord to take away that infirmity. Historians tell us it was probably an eye disease that the Apostle Paul had. That was not only that not only did it hinder his eyesight, but it was also something that was not pleasant to look at. And so uh, he had this problem. And God, when God refused to to take it away, Paul had to change his approach. Instead of praying after three times, look, if you're praying, and I'm all for continuing to pray. I'm all for import, importunate prayer, which means just continuing to pray. When God doesn't seem to answer, continue to pray. But after three times, Paul said, you know what, God, I guess that the answer is no at this, po at this point anyway. Sometimes God's answer is yes, and he answers our prayer right away. Sometimes God's answer is no, because that's just not what is going to be good for you. That's just not what I want you to have. And at some point, we have to realize that and adjust. But sometimes God's answer is not yet. It's just not the right timing. I may, I, this may be what I want for you, but you need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Hey, I've made a lot more mistakes in my 53 years of life and over 35 years in ministry. I've made a lot more mistakes by getting ahead of God than I have by being patient and waiting on God. 
and realizing that his strength, but, but finally, uh, Paul changed his perspective. In fact, look what he said. Go back up to, go back up to uh, verse number 10 of 2 Corinthians 12. He had prayed three times for God to take it away. And then in verse 10, his whole attitude toward it changed. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. Uh, he said, I, I don't look at it anymore as a limitation. I see value in it now. He, he said, I finally see what God is doing in my life, and I know he's using this to make me strong in his power. And we too must learn to take pleasure in our weaknesses or those things that tax us physically and emotionally. Those things that bring us to the limits of our strength because when we get there, when we get to where the place where we just think, I can't do it, Lord, that's the place Jesus is trying to get us to, uh, where we give up and we say, I, I'm, I can't do this. God says, finally, we've got to the place where my power can, can in, infill your weakness and through my power, something can get accomplished for the cause of Christ. Hey, that's why, uh, that's why uh, whatever it is in your life that drives you to your knees every day to depend on him for strength isn't a bad thing. It's not an enemy thing. Every parent of teenagers, at some point, uh, you'll have that you'll have that circumstance where you're you're just exasperated and and I don't know what to do or how to, where to go and let that drive you to your knees and let your weakness and your inability in that area allow God to come in and His strength and His power to be the strength that we need. Oh, it's something to glory in, and and why do we need His power? I, let's go back to Ephesians 6 and we'll be done tonight. Look at verse number 11 and 12 again. We need his power to stand, but why do we need his power to stand? He says, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Oh, one reason we need his power, the really the only reason we need his power is that we're in a spiritual battle uh, for our lives, for our spiritual lives. Uh, and we'll look more at this battle in the weeks to come as we examine our armor, but we need to be strong in the Lord because we face this spiritual enemy and we see in Peter and other places, he's a, he's a roaring lion. He is our adversary, the devil, and it's spiritual warfare. We looked at today on Veterans Day, a physical battle, and, and, uh, and we honored those who have fought in physical battles. But this battle we're looking at tonight, this battle we're engaged in today is a spiritual battle. And so may you and I be strong in the Lord. And we're strong in the Lord by becoming weak in ourselves. Less of us, more of God. I like what John said. He said, he said, uh, he, he said I must decrease and he must increase. Less of us is more of him. I, when I first got saved, the preacher that was at the church there in California where I got saved, where my, fa my wife and her sister's family went to, uh, went to church and he used to say when he'd pray, say, Lord, hide me behind the cross. And I used to look. There wasn't a cross on the front of the pulpit. Uh, there wasn't a cross on the Lord's Supper table. And I was confused a little bit about what that meant until over time and me growing spiritually, I realized what he was saying was, Lord, let there be less of me so that there can be more of you. Let me be weak so that you can be strong. And that's how to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Why? That we might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We can't stand in our strength. We've got to stand in his strength.